things at build and we have nice updates for them. Uh, so WinUI 3 uh, was in preview one at build. Now we have preview two that was released on Wednesday. And for WebView 2, we're actually releasing an SDK uh, next week. Uh, they'll update that for everyone. So to give you a bit more detail for that, I'm going to hand it off to Jesse Bishop, who actually leads Project Reunion, and Adam Braden, who owns our app model on Windows. If I could just say, apparently we're not getting any sound in the call at all. Uh, That's what I'm hearing. Let me take a look here <laughs> once. Okay. Maybe we should try to just debug that first. There's audio on YouTube. I hear it on YouTube. Apparently it just came back, so we missed the, the first part. Yeah, there's audio on YouTube that I'm hearing. Are we back? All right. All right. All right. Did, I, did everyone hear everything, or should I start? Should I start again? Because we want to know what Kevin's doing, because clearly he's not like painting his house because he's got like really boring white backgrounds in his house. Man, what's going on? This is actually my closet, my master <laughs> closet. <laughs> That's the white wall in the closet because you don't really paint the walls interesting in the closet. <laughs> well, maybe you don't. Okay, I mean, yeah. I, I, so for those that did maybe didn't hear, catch us up on everything since Bill. Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, I just wanted to just let everybody know what we did announce. And we talked about Project Reunion, which really is about trying to bring together and totally simplify development for Windows. Uh, and it brings together UWP and Win32. So as you use the reunion libraries, it'll work in both of them. It really lifts the APIs out of the OS, making it simpler to build an app. And it will work now down level. So all that code that we released in the reunion will work across the entire Windows ecosystem. Uh, we announced two things, which were WinUI 3 and WebView 2, which are the first two components. We actually have updates to them. On Wednesday, we released an update to WinUI 2. Uh, the WinUI 3 Preview 2. And then we're also, for WebView 2, are releasing an update next week. So to go and drill in a little bit more to what's in those, because that's what everybody really wants to know about, uh, Jesse Bishop, who leads Project Reunion, will talk about that. And then Adam Braden is going to talk about the app model on Windows and specifically some of the APIs we're delivering there. So let me hand it off to those two guys here now. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So uh, I am sharing my screen here, and I just wanted to start with a quick tour of the Project Reunion GitHub repo. So we sort of soft launched this repo with the build conference in May. Uh, and so I won't spend too much time going through kind of the general overview here. Instead, I'll just say we have lots of great info on the repo. And so please do visit if you um, you know are interested and let us know if you have any questions. For example, there's this nice readme here that kind of explains the, the general overview of what Project Reunion is and how it can benefit your apps. And so what I'd like to do is actually go into a bit more detail on what we're really focused on right now. Uh, and so this is a pending update to the roadmap in the, in the repo right now. So you'll be able to see this very soon. Um, and so I want to talk about the focus areas that the team is working on. So as we kind of work on the Windows platform as a whole and continue to break down those barriers between Win32 and UWP and also add new functionality, uh, we want to make sure we're sequencing this work so that it starts being useful to developers like as soon as possible. So since Build, we've been watching this repo and reviewing feedback we got from Build and other sources, and we've been kind of organizing our engineering efforts to have a pipeline of proposals and specs that we're actually sharing on GitHub so that everyone can go and review and give feedback on them, and then we can build them. Uh, and so these are not like idle proposals. Uh, generally, the ones posted by at least our team at the minimum are things that we're actually directly working on that align with this first round of focus areas. And so I have some examples here. Uh, this list isn't exhaustive. Uh, we have lots of stuff in progress, but I wanted to highlight kind of these four main focus areas that we're aligning our work with. And so the first two are kind of some specific areas, and then the last two are about the broader fundamentals for the whole platform. And so the first category we see here is the one that people may be most familiar with already since it's kind of the top of the technology stack. And we've been uh, doing this a bit ahead in some areas like WinUI, uh, as well as the Chromium-based WebView 2, um, and then building the cross-platform layers like React Native to actually work on top of WinUI as the native platform when you run them on Windows. And so if you follow these links, we can actually see that uh, you know, we have some more specific detailed roadmaps for some of these like um, WinUI 3. I'll just switch over here to 
kind of its its readme. And so this is also info that we had at build. But uh, just to reiterate, we're kind of following this timeline. And so if you drill into these, you can get a little bit more details about how WinUI is going open source and when we'll start to see kind of the pre next round of previews and then the first go live where we're recommending you can actually start building apps on it for both Win32 and UWP in, in November. Um, the second category is some new hardware light up that we're working on. So great hardware support, you know, has always been kind of an advantage of native apps and, and the strength of Windows. And so we've got some great stuff in progress on that front, which we'll also be posting uh, issues on in the next little while. And the stuff that really interests me being on the developer platform team is kind of these last categories. And so the, the third one covers platform fundamentals. And so we're focusing on progress in some areas that we've had like strong feedback on from developers and that we really believe Project Reunion can help, uh, including these among other things. So like some new system and app lifecycle APIs, which are especially beneficial for Win32 apps to kind of opt in to get better battery life and update more easily and other great stuff. And I think Adam will tell us more about that in a minute. Um, some windowing unification and improvement uh, across Win32 and UWP, so it gets easier to get rich desktop windowing in any app, as well as some of the new capabilities and device support. Um, so we're also going to have more details on that really soon. And then the text rendering platform. And so we posted this one recently, and actually people have been really interested, which is awesome. Um, we're decoupling DirectWrite, which is the the great text rendering engine that's currently built into Windows. So we're actually taking it out of the OS and evolving it with some new features. Um, and finally, we're working on some other areas not really listed here, uh, like file picker dialogue improvements. And we're working toward file access API improvements, which I know has been especially painful for UWP, um, and, and some other interesting stuff that you'll see in this repo. Uh, and finally, the final category covers changes to the platform and app deployment that lets us deliver on the sort of general project reunion principles. And so this is a lot of infrastructure work around uh, decoupling the dev platform from the OS, like you may have already seen with things like WinUI, uh, ensuring all of the features work on supported all like supported Windows versions across Win32 and UWP. And we're actually doing the work to polyfill as needed to kind of keep the um, those APIs working consistently so that you don't have to. Um, to start, this means that we're kind of targeting 1809, which I think is the October 2018 uh, update and up at minimum. Uh, and then some components will actually work on an even broader range. And then finally, we're starting to, like I was saying, really work on GitHub. So we're moving our feature design docs and our API review process and some code to GitHub, uh, which is why I'm really here to kind of show show this. Um, you know, our goal is, is really that in part we want everyone to just have better visibility into what we're working on and make sure that we have an easy way for, for everybody watching and other developers to give feedback and even contribute directly to the platform. And so these three links at the bottom here, you can see proposals and specs and code. Um, this is actually just our basic workflow. It's really simple by design. And behind the scenes, you know, the engineering teams are still doing their normal thing about capacity planning and API reviews and testing and making sure everything is supported and durable for a long time. Um, but these are like kind of three key parts of the planning process for Project Reunion, where we'd love everyone watching to come help us you know, shape the direction we're going with the Windows Dev Platform. And so these proposals you can see here, if you follow these links, these are just issues in the repo. And we're doing these for all of the new work we're doing. Um, and like we, some of the ones I talked about, some are very broad, like decoupling the whole platform and making it available to Win32 and UWP. Uh, and some are very targeted, like those windowing improvements. And so we've started opening feature proposals for the first wave of work we're doing. Um, anybody else can open more too, and we kind of prioritize and look at those as we go. Uh, the second step is to go and like write design docs and specs and stuff like that. So you can see, you know, here I'll pull up an example for that um, text platform for direct write that I was mentioning. And so, um, you know, these get pretty detailed about our roadmap for these things and our staging. Uh, we think this is interesting. A lot of people have been interested, so that's awesome to see. Um, and so we'd like to just keep continuing that. And so I'd also mention that some parts of the API, like WinUI, are kind of big and self-contained enough that they continue to have their own repos. So we're also trying to kind of organize and make sure it's easy to navigate these repos. But the intent is really this main project reunion repo you see here is kind of the main place to go for general Windows platform feedback and planning. Um, and with that, I actually want to turn it over to Adam to talk about some more specific examples of some of the cool stuff we're working on, especially in the fundamentals area. Adam? OK, thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Let me know when that's up. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the application lifecycle that we're, uh, that's a big part of Project Reunion. Let me take you a quick overview on the proposal uh, and do a, a bit more detail uh, than, than the overview that Jesse just gave. 
You can see that we're doing it uh, open source here on GitHub. It's uh, issue number 111. And what we're really trying to do is converge the application lifecycle across Win32 and UWP. It's a rather long proposal, so we won't go into all the details in this call, but I encourage you to uh, read and participate in it. It's one of our first examples showing how we can decouple uh, APIs from the OS and build converged APIs. And in this document, uh, we'll see how in V1 we're focusing on four uh, platform uh, features. And so let me scroll down across activation, instancing, restart recovery, and uh, resource management. Let me jump down into uh, and kind of give a, a nutshell summary of each of those sections. For activation, at one end of the scale, we have our classic Win32 apps that get their activation args in the form of a, a simple command line strings. At the other end, we have UWP apps, which get rich set of activation uh, activated event args, which are strongly typed for each different kind of activation. And the app lifecycle is going to bring these together into a core set of activated event args. And the goal is that any app can make a simple call to request these rich activation objects, whether they come through the command line or the, uh, the UWP activation contracts. And then if I jump down to instancing, you can see there's a lot of details filled into each one. Um, if I jump down to the instancing, we'll see that uh, this is really trying to converge the traditional uh, Windows apps, Win32 apps, that are multi-instance by default, whereas UWP apps are single instance. The app lifecycle component is going to decouple the UWP support for single instancing and make it available to any app. It will give your app an easy way to find out if there are other running instances, and then you as the developer can se selectively choose to redirect that activation to one of those other instances. In this way, the app can support the broad spectrum, whether they want to be unconstrained multi-instance, uh, selectively choose their multi-instancing, or converge on single instancing, all controlled by the app logic. The third area is app restart and recovery. This covers two related but slightly different scenarios. Uh, first is when your app wants to restart itself immediately for whatever reason and pass some sort of app-defined parameters. This is supported in UWP today, and usually uh, it's in response to some sort of configuration change. And the second uh, area is when your app wants to register for recovery and restart in cases where the system is updated or rebooted, or when the app encounters an uh, an unhandled exception or hangs, which is supported in Win32 today. The app lifecycle component is going to try and is going to converge these behaviors. And the last section here is around power management. We know that users are increasingly aware of apps that consume a lot of resources, burn in the CPU, and drain in their battery. The app lifecycle is going to converge the various Win32 and UWP notifications that reflect those changes in the system. For example, power usage, battery status, user act interactivity, and so on. And so your app can listen for these notifications and make intelligent decisions, such as whether or not it's a good time to schedule high resource operations. In addition, uh, your apps will be able to opt into advanced resource management, such as throttling, or go all the way to support um, UWP's suspension uh, notifications. So that's it kind of uh, as the initial deep dive into each of these uh, four areas. In the proposal here, you'll also see that um, we have this scope section, and this really lists the requirements and the priorities uh, for, the, for the proposal. And this is an area where you guys uh, with the community can get involved in letting us know is our priorities on what are must have versus could have, you know, meets your expectations, uh, or whether or not you want to argue for one or the, uh, over the other and just let us know whether or not we've got it right. Uh, I think we're actively we are actively discussing this proposal right now, and we really want your input on this converged app lifecycle. So that's uh, kind of a, a, the overview of, of one of the app model uh, proposals we have within the uh, repository here, and this one is going to require a lot more uh, deep architectural change. Uh, in order to lift those components uh, out of the system and make them available for project reunion. But I did want to give you guys a demo for uh, what we 
a, a demo of an example for um, something that we've just recently created under the project reunion umbrella that really shows that we can undock Windows components from the OS and be able to make those available to all applications. Uh, one of the challenges that many developers have today is using the latest features in Windows because it locks them into targeting a specific Windows version. And that may or may not be supported by your organization or your customers. And so it really limits the reach of your app. An example is a feature called Registration Free WinRT that was introduced back in Windows 1903, uh, the May 19 update. It allows unpackaged apps to call WinRT components via the Fusion Manifest. And what I've got here is a simple uh, calculator app written in .NET Core 3.1 using WinForms that's a calculator skin, and it uses a C++ WinRT uh, component to do the math logic. And you'll notice that there's no packaging project here. So this, uh, in order to use WinRT components, they need to be manifested typically in the packaging project. But with 1903, we added support where you could add this functionality to the Fusion Manifest. And so if I ran this application today, uh, it would work on my current OS, uh, current OS all the way down to 1903, but it won't work on other currently supported operating systems, such as 1809. Uh, as part of Project Reunion, we've lifted this component out of the OS and into a NuGet package. And this allows you to take these existing applications um, that use this feature and easily adapt it so it works on all in uh, on all supported versions of Windows, thereby increasing the reach of your app for more customers. So how does it work? Uh, first off, we did publish this uh, package this week uh, called the Microsoft Windows Undocked Reg Free WinRT. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but it kind of communicates what its uh, what its purpose is. Uh, if you're a native application, that's all you really have to do. It initializes um, the activation pipeline to use this component uh, for your net in native applications. But since I'm a managed application, I have to call a little uh, initialize function in the start of my application in order to tell the component to uh, use the uh, redirect activation from the, the Fusion manifest. In order to do that, I have to uh, have a little declaration here in my code to be able to call that function. And for purposes of the demo, I wrapped it in a little bit of light up code so it's easy to show it failing on one version of the OS and then succeeding. So my current machine, I'm on the latest Windows Insider build and this is just going to work. But I do have a VM here that's running uh, Windows 1809. If I bring that up, you'll see, yes, I'm running Windows 1809. And what I've got here is I've deployed this application to this VM and I've got the XE and the manifest, the, the Fusion manifest, right side by side. And you'll see the component has been renamed so it won't be able to find my component. If I run this application, it's a, a simple calculator app. And you'll see that it could not find the type, the WinRT type, simple math. Uh, even though this should work on 1903, but because I'm working on 1809, it fails. By renaming this component, oops. By renaming this component, my app will now find it, and it should be able to uh, easily redirect the activation to that component and leverage the Fusion Manifest to use my uh, simple math types. And so that's it. I wanted to highlight a simple example of showing that we are able to lift various components out of the OS and increase the reach of your existing applications to use these new features uh, in, that are available in newer versions of Windows. And with that, uh, I'm done with the demo. Back to you, Kevin and Seth. This has been awesome. So I'm going to start with the obvious question just to make sure I understand completely what this is. So project reunion, and I'm going to I'm going to just word vomit. I shouldn't I shouldn't use those visuals, but I'm going to word spray. I it's getting worse. I'm going to word make man, I'm terrible at this. What I think project reunion is, and then tell me where I'm wrong or where I'm right. So what I'm understanding is that look, when I used to make WinForms apps a long time ago. I'm used to it. I have some stuff that I've done legacy. Project Reunion is the process of enabling those folks who have those kinds of applications 
to take advantage of all of the amazing new stuff, like for example, the store, among other things that are available in the Zamel universe. Am I am I getting the the gist of this right, Kevin? Uh, yes. I mean, if you, I think Adam did a really great job of showing how we're doing it, is and, and roughly how you can do it for your components too. As you lift the library up, its APIs will work for any application. As we lift those up, they'll work on any application type. So, for example. With WinUI, now that it's a lifted component, we'll make sure it works in any Windows application, UWP, Win32, and regardless of your UI framework, you can start to use those components. So these libraries are now standalone in some way of they can run in any of these app model types. And as more and more of them come out of the OS, the APIs that you can use that work across all of Windows get larger and larger. Uh, so the process just keeps getting to be like a snowball effect of, of, of growing that that set of APIs that you now can be confidently use anywhere in your existing applications. So just I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some questions, a bunch of other questions that I have. What we keep hearing about WinUI is that part of Project Reunion? Is it a separate thing? So it's sort of a yes and a yes. Each library you can adopt standalone. We don't want to make it so you have to go. Oh, I have to go start reusing a new project type to start getting the value. And just like Adam showed, it's much like a NuGet package, you just load it, and now I can use that component in an existing application. So yes, WinUI you can use separately without using all the rest of the WinUI, of the, of the Reunion libraries. Two, it is part of Reunion. Reunion, if you want to target Reunion, you can go use WinUI. It's a part of the Reunion family. And so we, we kind of give you a little bit of both, where you can pick and choose if you just want to use a library, and it's not monolithic. Like we've done in the past, the SDKs have been monolithic. If you want to build UWP, you got to use all of UWP. And that's not really the approach developers want. They, they like, I'll say if I go back in the old days, like the COM approach. You can get a COM library independently, you know, and hey, we never really had a bundling solution there. And we think with Reunion, now we have a way of bringing them all together, as well as letting you pick and choose the individual ones that you may want to adopt in your app. So the answer is yes, it's part of Reunion, but yes, you can also use it independently and standalone. All right, so my next question is, this sounds awesome, but is there like a cutoff on the OS versions and devices that Project Reunion APIs will support? Because I'm worried, like, I have this cool app that I want to, you know, take out of mothballs because it's so good. Is there an OS restriction or version or device that I need to think about? So the commitment we're making is that we will make sure that they continue to run. We do app compat, we test them all, bring it down level as best we can to the supported version of Windows. Uh, you know, and so like, will they work beyond that? In many cases, they actually probably will. Uh, and since many of them are in the open source, you know, they'll they'll continue to run on the older versions of OS that aren't supported. But we really want to make sure that hey, if you're an enterprise and you have all the supported versions of Windows, you can confidently build to those. Um, and as OSs get out of service, we're not going to do all the work to necessarily go validate it, but they'll probably work on many of those too. And so the answer is the supported versions of Windows is what we're making sure will work. So next question, because like we're we're all programmers here, and I see some of my friends here because I, I have the I have the YouTube chat open. Hello, everybody. We're programmers, and like we're like, well, there's this one thing, and then there's this other thing. We kind of like them both. Uh, but we want to make them better. So how do we fix it? Oh, we make another thing. And that's how usually programmers solve things. Is Project U Reunion another app model? It, it's so not validated. It's not really. So uh, at, at the end of the day, we are going to reuse most of the APIs in Windows. Now we've evolved the app model of Windows and we have changed that over time. We want to make sure old APIs work, and we're giving you new things. Adam talked about a whole lot of new capabilities. So yes, they will be new in Reunion, and the goal is that as that new comes available, you can use it across all supported versions of Windows. But Reunion is about bringing together a lot of just the existing technology, and while we introduce new features, they get that immediate reach, they get that immediate value. So the goal is we will evolve the platform, but Reunion itself is not trying to invent a, hey, stop everything you're doing, go rewrite to Reunion. The reunion is the union of Win32 and UWP brought to you available across all of Windows uh, components. So it's not itself a new thing, though we will introduce new components through reunion. So I don't the know if I got convoluted too much, the yes and no answers. 
<laughs> no, it kind of makes sense. Like you're you're saying that we don't want you to do new stuff. We're gonna replumb the stuff underneath and make it so that it's easier for you to do what you want. A a am I understanding that right? Well, I, I want you to do. I, I, I don't want you to take good code. I think Adam's pretty great. The APIs that you're running, if once you take a reunion library, now they'll run on more versions of Windows. You have to change the existing APIs for existing functionality. Where you want to get new functionality, you can then adopt and change just that code and not have to go and change code that's really unaffected by the feature that you're building. That's where I think developers get angry. It's like, well, I just wanted to use this one new feature and you make me rewrite these other 10. Why do I have to rewrite the 10 to get to the one? And if there's a reasonable reason, like there's a dependency, great. But a lot of the reasons were, I'll say just, arbitrary at the time because of the model we picked. The model we're picking now is you take and you pay for the feature that you're adding and not for other parts of the code having to change. Got it. So here's another thing. Again, I was a WinForms person a long time ago, um, and I remember the particular pains I had when creating an installer. Uh, is there like something extra I need to do for things that are based on Project Reunion to get installed, or how does that work? So uh, Adam, Jesse, maybe one of you guys will take that and go a little bit deep on that. Adam, do you want to talk about the sort of framework package mechanism we're planning to use? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, one of the goals with Project Reunion in order to lift these OS components out of the OS uh, is we do need a redistribution mechanism that works. Fortunately, with MSIX framework packages, we already have that technology, but to date, we've been very um, selective in how we've used it. You've typically only seen it with the .NET native runtime, uh, the VC libs, DirectX, uh, and WinUI itself more recently. Uh, but we do expect that more of Project Reunion for some of these foundation pieces will be redistributed as a framework package going forward. Now, if you're a packaged app coming from the store, that's a great solution. Your app doesn't have to uh, uh, rely or it doesn't have to carry around the framework package. The store will just, you, you declare a dependency and the store will install it for you and update or service it as needed. Um, however, one of the challenges just there is- Just to add to that, I'll say, oh, go I ahead, just, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, one of the challenges is unpackaged applications. Uh, Currently, there is no model for an unpackaged app to use a framework package. However, one of the proposals on the repository is a, is a solution for solving that problem to allow unpackaged apps to use framework packages. Jesse? I was just going to say that not everyone may be familiar with framework packages, right? And so it's just worth calling out that they're a really awesome technology that let us take um, components and, and APIs and ship them decoupled from the OS and still service them uh, through sort of the Windows servicing and update mechanism. So you kind of get the benefits of us being able to do security fixes and things like that, um, even though it's not directly part of the operating system and it saves on disk space, uh, but you still kind of get to interact with it and use it as a developer through sort of a mechanism like NuGet, which is is pretty familiar, right? Awesome, I, that's cool. I mean, that's a really good answer. Uh, another question I have, is there, so I've done some UWP stuff, and there was some stuff in UWP that was that was really awesome that was not in WinForms. And so for me, it's hard to picture them working together. Will UWP apps work with, with Project Reunion? Uh, yeah, they will. And so here's where I think it's, I'll, I'll go into a few examples here of how we're going to introduce it. For example, you're saying, well, I already have WinUI inside of UWP. What does it mean to be outside? Well, that one required you to update the OS to get those features. And you can continue to use the one that's built with the OS, but all of new development is done outside. So you can use WinUI 3 directly inside of your UWP application and not have to go and use just the one that's built into the OS. So these components will work inside of UWP. Now, there are some interesting things we're going to have to resolve, and I'll give you some of the inside the Beltway discussions we've had that maybe you'll understand. Like when it comes down to the security sandbox, UDP comes with one, and we want to build one into Reunion that can be then iterated on outside of just updates to the OS. So and to do that, we're going to have to enable UDP from the core to delegate its container and its security model to a Reunion library. 
So over time, because people say, well, how are you going to do that? We have ways of doing that in the OS where we can route the capabilities to a framework package. So this framework package can come down separately than the OS shipped image that everybody gets as far as updates and replace the functionality that either Win32 or UWP had and allow it to be delegated to reunion libraries. And that's something we're working on now for some of these more complex areas. Some of them, they're open source, they're easy to go do. Other ones, we're gonna have to do some real, that's why we're going a little bit slower, getting some of those components. Deep interactions and changes where the framework packages take over the core functionality that at times is built deep into the OS. And this is an interesting, interesting approach because it feels very much like the web way of doing things when the browser you know doesn't have everything there is these things called polyfills is is this what we're talking about is this like is there like a polyfill api will they work exactly with all of the versions you see you see what i'm getting at oh absolutely it's like it's one of the inspired I, I'll, I'll let jesse maybe uh jump in on that one and give some uh, more more color into how we uh we're doing that sorry i'm, I'm losing a bit of a connection here could we Oh, as far as polyfills? Oh, and sure. How do polyfill? Yeah, so we're doing a, a mix of things. Um, but basically, as we lift things out of the OS, we're kind of doing the work to test them down level on different supported versions of Windows. And then wherever they're relying on the OS APIs, the underlying OS APIs that may not exist, we're doing kind of a few different ways, kind of the same as you would in the web world, where maybe we need to go implement uh, on top of different OS APIs on on sort of different OS versions. And so we kind of take on the, the pain and cost of doing that instead of app developers having to. So things will actually sort of gracefully fall back to a slightly different mechanism, but it's not something that you as an app developer really need to worry about. We just take care of it all behind the scenes in the implementation. And so that's part of the work we're actually doing as we lift things out of the OS, where it's not just sort of a mechanical copy and paste. We're actually going back and testing and making sure that everything works properly and relayering on top of the right OS APIs. That's awesome. And so yeah, yeah. I just want to say more. the Reg Free WinRT is a good example of that, actually, that, that Adam showed. So that's actually something that was in the OS and only worked on sort of, I think, 19H1 plus. And, and as a part of decoupling it, it now works further back. And so you get to address a larger market without having to do any work because we've done that polyfill. Now, cool, I, I will give a caveat to that polyfill. There'll be times, especially things that are hardware dependent or things that truly require like something deep in the OS that only really comes in the latest one. We'll do our best to polyfill. We want to make sure the APIs are consistent and easy to use, but functionality then can light up. So there'll be some advantage. I, sometimes it feels like, oh, great, everything will work on every version of Windows. No. There'll be innovation in hardware where you'll need to detect, hey, is this feature capable of doing the new ABC thing that you want to go do? But it'll be an API where we'll do the work to do the best fallback, and then you can light up with that new functionality easily. Awesome. So one of the things that I saw that was interesting is because you're making this new layer, it looks like, at the OS level, and I saw, I thought, I saw the project with C++ and C Sharp, are we exposing this layer to other languages? Because I feel like there's like some cool stuff that you could do with this new layer. So uh, we are, and we're, we're excited about enabling new languages. It's something that we've done at Microsoft a lot. Um, we're working on support for Rust. Um, there's also someone who started a project for Python. It's not complete yet, but we really, you know, as we work with the community, we kind of want to know what, what do people want to use, what languages are of value, and how we can make that simpler for them so they can reuse code or just enjoy the language of choice. Uh, and so you can, you know, obviously you can continue to use like things like JavaScript through something like React Native, um, and of course to support our main languages. But we're looking at the right way to do it because obviously the way we would do Rust is different than the way that we would do JavaScript. So we want to do it, we want to do it in a way that's really the way a developer in that ecosystem works uh, and not just kind of jam a, a one model on, on, on everyone, that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you, you want to you tastefully open this up to other languages and not make Python look like C++ or you know, JavaScript look like Rust kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and everybody who knows uh, some of our C++ history will know there are times we tried to do that in C++ with little hats. And that 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 was you know not well received. Yeah, so I, that's why I use the word tastefully. So yeah. I, so I here's another question. Yeah, 
Here's another question I have for you. I, because if I understand this right, Project Reunion is kind of an open source thing, but there's underlying Windows things. How much of the Windows platform is actually going to be open source? Uh, it, it really depends. I mean, it's hard to give a percentage. I think right now we're looking, I'll say, at the developer API layer. There are parts of Windows that are open source that really aren't part of our developer API set. They're part of our security system. They're part of other ecosystem pieces like printing and those other things. But uh, for the developer API set, we're looking to open source really as much as we can that's pragmatic and reasonable. I mean, there are certain things that are written in kernel mode that we're not going to go open source. That doesn't always make sense. Uh, we'll lift some of those into user mode and maybe we will open source them. So our goal is to open source what we can in an order that, that our customers are saying, hey, this is the ones where I want to contribute or I want to deliver them side by side. We'll deliver DLLs that can be side by side installed as part of a union you know, in almost every case. And then where we can open source them, we'll do that in a reasonable order, just because a lot of the code in Windows is very deeply integrated with our build system. But we really do want to go with that as far as we can. We don't really have a, a number in mind. We'll just continue to do that as, you know, as, as is reasonably possible for us. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned kernel and user mode because I'm starting to recognize that Project Reunion is gluing a lot of the programming space across the kernel as well as user mode. And so you can make decisions to move things out of kernel, kernel mode that you have to and maybe things back in. Is, is, that, yeah. is that about right? Oh, it, it actually is. So what, I mean, the way of looking at it is a little bit is we'll leave what's in kernel mode, what has to be there. We'll add a few APIs to make it so that the user mode component can then control that. And then the user mode component is lifted out of the OS. So we have to actually refactor some of those layers into the min bar APIs that you'd want really in kernel mode. And this reduces in essence our security issues. It, there's a lot of benefits outside of just giving developers more flexibility and agility. Uh, and it's something that we've wanted to do over time. And I don't know if everybody knows, but user was built in kernel mode back in 2000. You know, and we've been lifting pieces of that out of kernel mode where we make sense. And so it's things where we have a history that we have to unwind or optimize and relayer it a bit. And so we're looking at those deeply. And that's really cool because lifting things out of kernel mode into user mode provides an extra level of safety, which is really nice. Absolutely. That is, like I said, there are benefits across the board uh, where we can do that. All right. So my next question is: I'm going to play. I'm going to put my advocate's hat on because I'm a I'm a developer advocate. Are we going to force people using Project Reunion to use MSIX app containers and the store? Or is it like you get this all this benefit and now we're gonna we're gonna make sure you do this too? Is that going to happen? Because I, I got to keep us all honest here. I'll hand that off to Jesse. I think he's got some strong opinions on this one. <laughs> well, the answer is basically no. We're going to advocate for a certain set of technologies, but uh, you know, we're not going to require the use of them. So actually, Adam's an expert in this area. Did you have anything you wanted to say in particular? Uh, just, to re yeah, just to reiterate what uh, you mentioned in that uh, the goal of Project Reunion is to not require any of this. Obviously, we think a, a well-trusted, secure application will want to take advantage of some of those features like the app container, uh, or if the developer doesn't want to manage their own CDN and they can leverage the store, that's a great solution for them. Uh, but Project Reunion itself, if you have an MSI-based installer and you're already optimized uh, in that workflow or that model, you should go ahead and be able to use Project Reunion uh, in that space. Awesome. So, so uh, sorry, go I, ahead. A more, you know, it's interesting. I heard these guys talk a little bit because I feel like we talk both sides sometimes. We advocate and we want to be inclusive. And, and it is a, a dual sword for us. We will really want to basically say, hey, we don't want you to have, if you want to come up with different technologies and use them, we want to make sure you can use what you can and only change what you have to to get the new functionality. At the same time, we believe there's a set of technologies that lead to the best experience that you can build for an end user. Like when you use MSIX, your reliability goes through the roof. And it's so much better for everyone in the ecosystem, every end user to actually have that. Now, there are times when that's not part of your workflow as a developer. It's not where you're investing right now. It's not what your business needs you to go do. And we want to make sure that you can invest right for your business, but we're advocating for where you can go use the best technologies to deliver the best experience uh, for end users. Uh, and even for your developer you know, productivity. 
And that depends on everyone, you know, obviously what your history is. So we tend to advocate, but we want to be extremely inclusive of existing technology that people have used over time, knowing that you have a heavy investment in many of those. So you'll see us kind of do both, advocate and be inclusive. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, another question that I've been I've been thinking about. I mean, if I have a because I, I'm if I'm understanding Project Reunion right, it's basically expanding the layers, the layer in the OS level that allows me to hook on to things that are quite new. Or if you're back in, in UWP to hook on to other things that maybe were useful in Win32 that are not available in UWP, how difficult is it for me if I'm using UWP or Win32 to start using the Project Reunion APIs? Because I, I'd imagine that if I want to start taking advantage of the newer stuff in my old WinForms app, I have to use the Project Reunion API somehow. H how does that work? So I think uh, Adam gave, I think, a really good example about how how it actually technically works. So why don't you go through maybe again a little bit, Adam, give a little more example about how those APIs through NuGet, through the DLLs works. Sure. Uh, and Seth, I'd actually use the term, we're moving the platform line down uh, in the in the platform. And, and many of the components are actually being lifted above that platform line into framework redistributable packages. Uh, by and large, some of those core deployment and app model features will probably be a, a common framework package that your app will reference and just use like you would any other framework package or NuGet package and be able to call those APIs, uh, whether they're unpackaged or packaged. And so, you know, we're really looking at trying to push that layer down. We want to make that open source so you can see what APIs we're calling. Uh, and we really want to make sure that you know these framework packages uh, or NuGets, uh, some of them may be targeted NuGet packages. You know you can use for uh, in your applications. So is it as easy as just adding a NuGet package, or is there something else that I need to do? Uh, it's pretty much add a NuGet. Like WinUI is a great example on WebView too. You just add a NuGet package and you get it. Now for anyone who wants to start from scratch and wants to make sure that they get all the value of reunion, we're looking at making you know, some project types that can go do that, where I can go say, create a new project, you know, drag in my, some of my existing code, or link against all the APIs there, you know, and, and therefore you just, now you have a reunion you know, solution. Uh, but we, we also wanna have the NuGet model where you can just pick DLL by DLL or namespace by namespace and bring those into your existing application. Uh, that's the beauty of using the library model. Right, the library model gives you that flexibility uh, to go do that. So I'm I'm starting to understand more about Project Reunion. If the APIs aren't part of the OS anymore, are they going to be supported the same way and get security stability fixes that you would normally get with OS level stuff? So in many ways, internally, we think of these as part of the OS that are shipped separately. They're almost like drivers. Drivers ship outside the OS, but we service them, make sure they're up to date and everything else. So we will manage them from that, from a, some, from a life cycle point of view, like they're part of the OS. They just happen to be updatable without doing a service update to Windows. Instead, you update the framework package. The C runtime, we're actually, for example, the C runtime is actually delivered as a framework package and we service that you know, either aligned with a Windows update or out of band of a Windows update. So it gives us a nice flexibility where we can update just that framework package if we find the security flaw in it, and then it will go get updated to everyone out there uh, and not requiring you to do a, you know, full Windows update um, process. Instead, the framework package gets another one, just like a new version, it will be updated and we've serviced it. So yes, but we actually have way better flexibility and agility um, and I think a lot of enterprises will find that this is a much more friendly model uh, because now they, they don't have to update all of their devices. Only the apps that use that framework package will actually get the updates. We actually only bring down framework packages for the devices that have apps that use those framework packages. So it'll be a much lighter way to touch uh, across the industry. Got it. So another question regarding devices, how does Project Reunion relate to 10X? So, uh, you know, we, in, and so we really, like, 
like one of the things we haven't really discussed, and we've been talking a little bit about 10x. Uh, we're really not discussing right now about 10x in general. And so as we discuss 10x, we will be then discussing how product reunion relates to it. So I hate to deflect off that a little bit, but I don't really want to talk about product reunion and how it relates to 10x. Instead, I want to, when we actually talk about 10x, we'll talk about how it impacts and how it works across the entire ecosystem. So not quite ready to answer the the reunion 10x question. We'll answer that when we answer the 10x question. Got it. So I, I have heard, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, that there are some customers blocked from installing the May 2020 update. I, is that true? What's up with that? So there are some customers who will not see it updated. But first, let me go back and tell you a little bit the way we update Windows. We like to update it in rings. Because the last thing we want to do is have an update go out and we can only test on a certain number of machines. Windows got 1 billion devices, and they're different, right? As you modify them, update what's running on them, we can't test everything. So we do it in rings, and we build confidence in those rings so we can moderate the impact to customers. So we've been actually rolling it out in different various rings. Those who have similar configurations, they'll get updated faster. And as we have unique ones, we'll update a little bit slower. So we are now updating a small number, and we'll continue to update that. Seekers can usually find it a little bit faster. If you want to go get it, you can go seek it. I forget the exact URL to go to to get it, um, but obviously you can search for that and find it. Uh, but we'll be rolling it out in a way that builds confidence with customers. And a lot of times if we do see issues, we'll stop with the rollout, get the issue fixed, and then continue the rollout. This is interesting because it like, like most people take the OS for granted. I mean, I just show up and it turns on and it turns on a lot faster than it did you know, a long time ago. Uh, Yep. Tell us about like the commitment that Microsoft has for Windows in general. Uh, Windows is an incredibly valuable asset to Microsoft. A lot of customers use Windows. Obviously, now we've actually seen a resurgence and growth in number of use minutes in Windows. If you really want to be productive in a world with remote collaboration, Windows is absolutely key. And we take that seriously. And we're actually optimizing it and making sure that whatever customers want to use it for, it can go solve. And we see our Windows asset as solving many, many problems. You'll see us investing in making it great for developers. We want to make it great for remote learning. We want to make it for remote work. We want to make sure you can use things like WVD to build a distributed solution, a cloud-based solution for it. So Windows is kind of our anchor in reaching out to our customers. And we take that seriously for developers, as we know that it is the connection point for them to get to their customer. And we wanna make sure that that customer is up to date, that developers have flexibility in reaching that diverse set of, of, of devices and, and that ecosystem, different hardware form factors. So for us, Windows is our primary channel to help developers reach customers uh, and how customers will use and interact uh, with experiences. This is awesome. So. Uh if, if you're okay, maybe a couple more minutes on some questions that I've been looking at on, on YouTube from Alexander. Is Rust WinRT going to support building WinUI apps? That's a good question. Uh, we're looking at Rust support, so uh, we're looking at making that happen. So we, I don't think we have it completely working yet, but it's something we're evaluating. Awesome. From Darren. How granular are we going to end up with these sort of NuGet packages, right? Is the naming going to be discoverable if you want to know what you need? But are we going to end up with a massive graph of NuGet? That's a really good question. Like, because I suspect the Project Reunion is going to touch a lot of stuff in the OS. Do we? Are we going to need a package for each one of them? That is a great question. I keep waiting for that question because that's one of the things I worry about too. Um, and so one of the things we've kind of at least debated is, well, well, at the at the minimum, we'll do it on a namespace by namespace basis, right? We want to make sure that we think about API that come in by namespace. Uh, maybe Jesse, I don't know, have we thought about it more bigger? I'll hand off to you for, are we doing anything bigger than a namespace or smaller? Because I think that's sort of been the model, but you may know yeah. the exception. Challenges. Right. And and so we, we also, I think there's uh, a bit of, you know, again, a double-edged sword or duality here where we want to say you can incrementally use specific components without taking you know the whole new platform but then we also want to make it really easy to use and so we have a couple things that we are planning to do and we'll talk more about this in the github repo and i think namespace is a good way to think about the granularity like for example when ui you kind of think of that as microsoft ui xaml the namespace and it gives you all the xaml controls and so on but you know um i wouldn't say 
you know, we're totally settled on this yet. Uh, and we're also trying to talk about, you were mentioning the project templates, if you want to get started and have access to the sort of whole platform. We're also thinking about how you can kind of add the whole platform. If you think of a dependency graph, it'd be like adding the root node of the dependency graph and you get access to everything and then you kind of just use the bits you want. And then under the covers, the framework package mechanisms will make sure we're only pulling in the actual code that apps are using um, so that we're not, you know, bloating up the disk space on, on everybody's machines for things they aren't using. So I would say, um, you know, we're trying to balance those and uh, definitely watch the GitHub repo to see how that evolves because we'll be doing that kind of design in the open. Awesome. My feeling is as the namespace gets more and more covered and more of it grows together, it'll be more like, hey, just give me the whole thing. I mean, that, that's where a lot of it, and then those who need exceptions will go the other way. So I think that's where we'll end up. And while we're in the transition, as we grow the number of namespaces, there might be a little bit more fragmentation, like granularity in it. So, this is a so, ba so basically, this is a software project, and like we figure stuff out too. I mean, I, it's funny, like, Look, I, I worked at Microsoft now for five or so years, and we're all programmers. We just actually build tools for y'all to be more successful. And I mean, this, that's a good answer. It's a good pragmatic answer. Here's another question from Terry Cox. Will Acrylic work for Win32 and UWP? What's the access to low-level graphics from Terry? Um, OK, so I'll see that's like a couple questions in one. So. When you're using WinUI in your application, we are looking at enabling acrylic when you're using WinUI 3. So we're trying to figure out how to go make that acrylic work um, on the app. It will depend on where the app is and how the app is running, like what the graphics backing of it is. So there'll be some dependency there. Um, and that I think we're just still working through the details because acrylic, if you don't do it right, is very expensive at a performance level and battery level. So we really need for that to be done in our window manager and for us to have access to that. So there's some real technical challenges there to get the performance really, really highly tuned like we did um, for uh, in, inside of UWP. Still working on it, engage with uh, everyone else on the uh, WinUI repo and, and we'll go do that. As far as low level graphics, uh, we are definitely looking at, I mean, think about direct write, we're looking at direct, direct 2D, um, direct X obviously updates itself uh, and is built pretty deep into the OS because it's kind of at a driver level. Um, and already has great back support for running older versions of DirectX on the existing ecosystem. So uh, we feel pretty good that DirectX is already heading in a good direction uh, for the solution of hitting and reaching all of the devices and being used both in UWP uh, as well as Win32. Awesome. Well, you know how I love back support, not just for software, but for me because I'm getting older. So thank you so much. I've already kept you an extra six minutes. I want to thank you so much for your time, and I'm excited. Hopefully, we can do this more more often. Anytime, man. Love doing that. Love talking to everyone. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone that has come. Uh, by the way, please send us more questions. What we can monitor. Send us email. We want to know what's going on, what you're working on. I'd love to see how this is actually being used because I'm always surprised about how amazing. Microsoft customers are when they get something, they make amazing things. And I'm excited to see those too. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you at the next, and I want to get the name right because they're going to yell at me. App Development Community Stand Up. We'll see you then. Thanks everyone.